Hi, I'm Catherine Scott. I'm the developer advocate for an organization called Open Robotics. I'm here today to talk about Robot Operating System, or ROS2. Um, I'm going to give you just a brief overview of what's sort of in ROS2, what it does, and then sort of how it applies to uh, the general ARM community. So, so first slide. Um, let's give a quick overview of what we're going to talk about. So. First, I'm just going to cover what ROS2 is and why you should care about it, what's interesting about it, how it's changed. Um, then I'm going to talk a little bit about just sort of the, the robot development process with ROS2. And then um, after that, I'm going to talk a little bit about the component ecosystem, and that is to say all the parts that you use that may involve ARM components that you use to build the final robot system. So why don't we start, so, so what is what is ROS? What is Robot Operating System? So, so ROS is an acronym. It stands for Robot Operating System. It's probably the the largest, oldest, fastest growing ecosystem for robotics. And when I say oldest, I mean like it's about 13 years old. When I say fastest growing, it's growing. I, there's a bunch of metrics I could spout out to you, but it's growing extremely quickly. Um, and largest. Um, as far as I know, there's no other, there's no thing that even compares it to ROS in terms of like the size of the community, the size of the code base. It really is the biggest, baddest, most wonderful thing for building a robot. Um, the the sort of discrepancy that comes up is people say, well, it's, it's not an operating system. It really isn't an operating system. ROS is basically a layer that fits on top of an operating system, usually Ubuntu, to sort of enable you to do the things you want to do. Um, and the analogy I like to make is that like ROS is to robotics, like what, you know, Ruby on Rails or something similar is to web development. And it's all free and open source, so it's completely accessible. You can go out and start playing with it as soon as I'm done talking. Um, so I usually like to start with social proof because if people have either seen ROS in the past, like say five years ago, or have never heard of it, they don't really believe that this open source project is is as large and is um, sort of uh, pervasive in the community as it really is. So I usually like to start with just some social proof um, so people understand that this really is something that's used by a ton of people. It's used all over the world and it's used in everything from research to production systems. And so let's, let's go over some stats about the software itself. So as it stands in 2020, I just did the metrics report for this year. Um, there are 16,000 ROS packages um, with a bunch of different permutations for different ROS releases, um, and that's 40% growth from 2019. Um, just <clears throat> in August alone, we had 40 million deb downloads. That doesn't include Docker containers. Um, that doesn't include a bunch of other things, but a lot of people are downloading ROS. There's 4,000 tagged GitHub re repositories. There's 16,000 wiki pages that we host. We have sort of like five to 6,000 regular form users. Um, I know those are all sort of nerd stats. So if you want to talk about the business side of things, um, first thing I have to sort of say is that it's really hard to track because we have a BSD license. We don't know who's using ROS unless they come and talk to us at Open Robotics or talk to somebody we know. But we kind of at least try to keep tags on people. Um, there are 300 plus companies that I know of that are running ROS. Um, you can go look at the, the ROS uh, to technical steering committee to get an example of some of those companies. And it's everything from Fortune 500. And when I say Fortune 500, I mean up to like Fortune 50 companies to small businesses, startups, academic institutions, government entities, DARPA, NASA, NIST, Department of Transportation in the US. There's also sort of equivalent um, work done in the EU and in Asia. Um, if you want to look at things from the ac academic side of things, um, you know, as of August, there were 7,400 citations of like the original Ross paper, and it's used at a bunch of different universities for all different sorts of uh, robot related applications. So, drones, perceptions, control systems, uh, human robotic interaction, lots and lots of different things. Um, if you if you need some numbers to go go take home uh, to say your boss and say hey I want to try this Ross thing out and he says oh or they say hey this thing uh, I don't know about it I don't know who's using it there's metrics.ross.com that'll give you some of these metrics we also put out a, a yearly metrics report that I think will make the case pretty strongly that you know there's enough 
uh, inertia behind the library that it's worth checking out, at least, if not using day to day. Um, so why don't we, we start digging in at like a really high level, I'll give you like the, the you know, thousand foot overview of what's in ROS, what it looks like, because I, you know, I can say, oh, it does, you know, general robot things, but if I don't talk specifically about, you know, what the components look like, it, it really doesn't become concrete. I usually like to start out with like an unofficial philosophy of what I see in ROS that will give you an idea of what's going on. And I think the first thing that you, you see when you look at the ROS community is that it's generally based on federation over centralization. And that's just sort of an artifact of how it was built. I think, um, you know, nowadays there's a, people sort of default to, to very large mono repo code bases. ROS was really built um, before that and really actually kind of eschews that model of how you build things, at least as a community. And when I say federation, what I mean is there's lots of different smaller orgs all working together to build ROS components that all come together into a broader community, but there's no one centralized uh, entity really that's directing everything. Um, generally, ROS nodes and ROS components, we, we aim for small, simple, composable utilities. It's sort of the classic Linux or Unix mantra of keep it small, keep it composable, keep it reusable. Um, and, and what goes with that is sort of the classic software engineer, don't reinvent the wheel, don't repeat yourself, let's build shared common tools that everyone uses and then just keep honing those tools till they're perfect for everybody and very nicely defined. Um, the next point I think is probably the most important and also the one that people don't necessarily believe, I think there's a lot of fud around it, and that is the notion that ROS is non-exclusive. And what I mean by that is it's not like you have to use ROS and not use something else. It's more like uh, ROS can be used with anything if you so choose to build it that way. So it's not like you're picking this one thing necessarily in exclusion of something else. You can actually do both. And I, you know, I think more often than not, they're in sort of the professional robotics world. There are certain things like maybe a solver or um, a controller that is sort of proprietary and then you kind of fold that into ROS and that's okay. Um, the other bit that I think is worth talking about is that it's a little bit more inclusive. So ROS as a sort of code base is polyglot, meaning there's lots of different languages being used. I mean, not a lot, generally C++ and Python, but people add in a little bit of Java and Rust and um, JavaScript here and there. And so all of those things are possible in ROS and you can build your code base in whatever works for you. And they have interact with all these other things that are built in other languages. Um, and then I think the last and most important part is freedom. Like it's a non-restrictive license. You can go and do with it what you please. Um, so TLDR, uh, what's in ROS? So describing the features of a 13 year old project is you know, beyond the scope of a semester long course, but here's the short of it. Um, Ross has basically got a build tool uh, for, you know, multilingual shareable modules. Think of it as basically PyPy, but for robots, but also polyglot. Um, Ross sort of comes in, handles all your multi process management, um, is, you know, defines your, your publish subscribe system for inter process communication. Um, and then also define some like high level APIs for doing async and synchronous communication between like robot components. Um, there's a bunch of utilities for logging, diagnostics, visualization. Um, and then finally, there's a bunch of simulation tools um, for testing. Um, and I like to say it's just sort of batteries included robotics development. Oops, did I skip a slide? Uh, so, Bill, let's start with the, the first part of ROS, and I think this is probably the most uh, intimidating part, is the build tooling. Um, so, Colcon is sort of ROS's build tooling. Um, simply put, Colcon plus the other ROS tools do what most people's IDEs do, um, which is to say it manages building and installing your code. Um, it can build packages in a bunch of different languages and then collude them all together with a bunch of data serialization tools. Um, and then once that's all done, it puts the output executables and binaries in the right spot. And it's a little bit intimidating, but at the end of the day, it lets you sort of focus on writing code and building robots, not 
building the infrastructure that would be necessary to do that. Uh, ROS packages. So a ROS package is basically a collection of ROS software with maybe um, some message types that can be shared with other ROS modules and all the executables and tests and you know basically a small ROS project. Um, and that small ROS package can be just about anything. It can be a hardware driver, it can be a you know deep learning processing pipeline, it can be a visualization tool. Um, but is really a discrete unit of shareable code um, that is part of your robot and you can compose a robot out of lots of different ROS packages into something that is grander than the sum of its parts. And, and basically it's a, a way of building clean, reusable, modular robotic systems that are well encapsulated, I should add. Um, so in terms of like your bread and butter use of ROS, right? The, the core feature is what we call ROS node, which is basically a, a process, right? It's just a process um, where what we've done is built all the CLI tools that you need to, to start, stop, query, and configure that process. And it's basically just a standardized process API. Um, I have a little illustration over here. I don't know if you can see my mouse, um, but there's, there's three circles here, right? And like your standard robot, if you think about robots, is that robots are um, a set of sensors that take in data from the world, a set of actuators that do something in the world, and some way of making sense about that data to do a thing. And so if you think about a robot, uh, each of these components, right, the actuator, the sensor, and the control would each be a ROS node. Um, and this, along with the next thing I'm going to talk about, basically, I mean, if you've ever done a lot of, like, multi-process programming, it ROS is there to basically make this part easy. And it's saying, okay, well, just think about this control section, or just think about this sensor section. And especially if you're starting out, it makes it really, really easy to think about how you're going to build a behavior. Um, so next thing I want to talk about is ROS topics. So a topic is basically just an inner process communication mechanism. If you've worked with RabbitMQ or ZeroMQ or any other pub sub system, even like lightly Redis, it's basically the same thing. It's just a way of moving messages between one thing that's doing work to another thing that's doing work. And so in my sort of trivial example here, it is the glue that glues all of these things together and is the way they share data and share commands. Um, ROS basically is hundreds, if not thousands, of standard messages that define things like camera images or LIDAR images or, you know, how to move a wrist on a, on a robot or, uh, you know, data from an IMU. There's just tons and tons of these different kinds of messages. Um, on top of that, since you have this message bus, there's also a ro robust set of tools that allow you to to sniff the data, to log it, to profile its performance, to filter it, to namespace it, to do QoS control. Um, all of these different tools about moving data between robotics components are all sort of solved already. And they're all in ROS. Um, and right now for ROS2, these are all built on something called DDS. That's sort of a next level topic, but um, DDS allows us to have different vendors doing that movement of data. And so you can kind of pick the best vendor for whatever application you have. And that's a new feature in ROS2. Um, this, this whole package of features of being able to move data really, really cleanly is, uh, can easily be measured in person years of development. That's how much time we've spent on it, at least. <clears throat> um, so on top of that, sort of extra tools, um, ROS topics can be saved into something called a bag and which is just a serialization format and then visualize with the tool called Arvez. So ROS bags are sort of like like an airplane, like a black box for your robot. So you can save all the data that's moving through the robot and what it does and then save it, take it to your desktop and replay it and see what your robot was thinking at any given time, see how it made decisions, um, drop that data into a test um, and, and see how that test performs. Um, Bags are just a really, really fast and friendly um, tool for building deep learning models, machine learning models, moving data between collaborators, all sorts of different things. Um, sort of similarly in just a handy, useful tool that comes with ROS is RViz and RQT. 
And so these are basically Ross's tools for visualizing data, moving it around, and filtering it. Um, and these, these features just basically allow you to save time and promote collaboration. So last component that I want to talk about in a, a broad sort of, this is what's in ROS, and it's more not in ROS, it's sort of our partner uh, library, uh, is what we call Gazebo or Ignition Gazebo. And Ignition Gazebo is a simulator. So a lot of times when you're working with a robot, and we'll talk about this a little bit more in a second, it, you don't want to be in front of a robot. They're dangerous, they're heavy, they're they're, they can be a real pain to work with. And you really just want to work on your desktop and work on the bit of software that you're working on. And you want to try stuff before you put it on the robot so you don't break the robot. So a simulator basically allows you to go through, um, build a, what people call a digital twin, right? A, a very um, a simulated version of your robot and allow it to you know, move through a simulated environment and do what you think it ought to do. And this makes it so much easier to, you know, build your application, test your application, design before you build, do all the things that you want to do as a good engineer to build a very robust ro um, robot. And I think a lot of the more interesting and uh, useful research right now is actually starting out with simulation and then moving it to the, the real world. So these are the things that are kind of initially in a ROS package along with Ignition, but since we're federated, right, there's all these other people building all these other cool things that sort of fill out the ROS community. So I went and added a few of these. Hopefully you'll go take a look at them if there's something you're interested in. Um, and I guess the other thing I should say is this just like scratches the surface of sort of ROS sub communities. Um, so the first one is move it. So if you do anything with, you know, big industrial five, six, seven, eight, Axis arms, these big things moving around, working in an industrial area, picking stuff up. There's an entire set of tooling in ROS to just handle that and to do for kinematics, inverse kinematics, uh, path planning. That's all in MoveIt. That's sort of our companion library. Um, similarly, there's AutoWare. And so AutoWare focuses on um, vehicle autonomy. Uh, right now, I think they're really, really focused on low speed, like really well done. Um, vehicle autonomy for the masses. And so they focus entirely on building the tools and the ROS packages that make it possible to do, you know, autonomous vehicles. Um, if you're not trying to put something on a street, um, there's also the nav stack, or more specifically nav stack 2. And this is everything you need to do SLAM, simultaneous localization and mapping after a little bit of like perfection on your robot. Um, really, really interesting stuff. If you're interested in autonomous mobile robots, this basically enables that for free. Uh, if you're interested in drones, there's Mavros, which is effectively roster drones. I think I think there's another talk about this too. Um, we have our even more subgroups here. Uh, if you're interested in industrial applications, there's Ross Industrial. There's also an analog in the EU. Both of these are, are um, specifically tailored to bringing sort of new and innovative um, industrial applications out into the real world. Very interesting group. Uh, if you're not into industrial applications, we have a sort of nascent agriculture community coming together of people building all of these interesting ag robots that go into fields and pick things and weed and, and do all of that. If you're looking for help learning about ROS, we actually have an answers website, a Q&A website uh, that's like Stack Overflow, predate Stack Overflow, um, and allows you to get plugged into the ROS community. There's also ROS index, which gives you all of the indexes, uh, gives you the index of all the ROS packages that you can just, you know, install with the Debian. And so just as a sort of put a cap on it, um, what I have here is basically the, the quick three, if you need three resources to learn about ROS, um, and in particular ROS2, they're right here uh, on the left. The canonical ROS2 documentation in the middle, um, sort of our ROS discourse forums where you can kind of see what's happening. And then on the right, everything you need to know about simulation should be available at gazebosim.org. So you want to go check those out. That's like the quick, quickest way to learn about ROS. All right, so how do I get ROS running on ARM hardware? And so, you know, when you, change architectures, like people sometimes have issues, but I, I'm here to say it generally, everything ROS runs on ARM without problems usually. 
uh, and I wanted to give people an introduction to how to go about using different bits of ARM hardware along with ROS and sort of what the status of best practices are. Um, so to do this, let's let's partition out the world of potential ARM solutions and, and robots that are out there, and then we'll talk about how you address each of them. So on the left, there's sort of the um, single board computer SBC world, where you have a really cool tiny little computer that is ARM based that you want to use as the brains of a robot. Um, you know, generally, if you're going to go run Ubuntu on there, um, we can get ROS and we can get ROS2 running on it really, really simply. There's still some issues. I don't want to say issues, but you just have to be aware of like cross compilation stuff to, to handle your developer ergonomics, but it's fairly straightforward. On the other side, we get to the sort of embedded microcontrollers uh, that usually make up the components of robots. So the, hey, I'm building the software for a really cool vision sensor, or hey, I am, um, you know, I'm building a, an ARM-based motor driver for a piece of hardware uh, that's going to go on a robot. And making those components inter interact with ROS is a little, little bit different. We can talk about two different approaches to tackle that. Uh, so why don't, we, why don't we dive into the first one? OK, so case zero. Hey, I have some single board computer. I'm not going to pick favorites here, but I have some single board computer I picked up for 50 bucks. Um, so it's a nice one. And I want to run the long-term support newest version of ROS on it um, with some cool packages I saw on the internet. And uh, generally, if you install Ubuntu on this thing, uh, 2004, getting this done is trivial. Uh, it's possible with Debian as well, but it's a little bit dicier. So if you're just learning, make it easy on yourself. Do it with Ubuntu 2004, and the latest version of ROS should work fairly well. Um, there's two subcases, basically ARM64, which should be most of the things you're buying right now, um, that has Tier 1 support. You should be able to get Debian packages for it. Binaries, source code, all should be ready to go. Um, for ARMHF, has Tier 3 support you're probably compiling from source. Um, so once you sort of know those rules, installation is this thing on the right. If you can follow that set of instructions, you can get a full desktop installation of ROS running on your single board computer. And inside of it, um, there's a series of tutorials. You can go and pull somebody else's tutorials and, and give it a shot. Uh, so let's go. Okay, so let's say you don't you actually want to build a robot. You don't want to just look at ROS, so you're in it to win it. You're gonna go out and build a robot. Um, on the right there is the sort of our blessed robot, which is Turtlebot. That's a Turtlebot waffle. Um, and you want to use a single board computer to do this. The thing I always recommend is before you begin, think about the developer ergonomics of building a robot. Um, and the most important things to, to think about are your robot is a robot. Your robot is not your desktop. Um, and so, you know, the robot will be optimized for what its task is, and it may not be optimized for you doing software development on it. Um, and you may think, like, do you really want to sit in front of a robot all day? And if somebody comes to you at your, you know, boring job, you say, oh, yeah, I want to sit in front of a robot all day. In reality, you do not want to sit in front of a robot all day. <laughs> you know, you're going to be on the floor. It's not going to compile things quick enough for you. You're going to have to plug stuff in all the time. You really want to think about how you're going to do stuff. Um, and we really suggest that you use simulation and a desktop for development, and you invest some time in building or using somebody else's cross-compilation infrastructure. Um, so continuing down this case, um, you have a ROS robot. It's got a single board computer. Building out the simulation first will save you so much time in the in the long run. Um, for developers generally, that that you know write code, run it, compile it, or compile it, run it, debug it loop should be super duper duper fast. Um, and depending on you know what SBC you choose, that could be not the case. Um, and then also. Debugging on hardware, especially prototype robot hardware, is really hard because you don't know if something is failing because it is a mechanical problem, an electrical problem, or a software problem. And if you do your robot software development in simulation, you've basically eliminated two failure modes. 
and you know decidedly that, hey, the problem I'm dealing with is in software. And then, you know, once you think you've solved all those problems in software, you can then go drop it onto hardware and um, it should hopefully just work. It's a hardware problem if it doesn't work. <laughs> um, so what I've done here is I've dropped the, a quick link in for basically uh, cross compilation tutorials for ARM hardware. And so what you really want to get good at is if you're working on your desktop where things are running fast, you know, oh, I'm going to go cross compile it. And then, you know, you have to figure out how you're going to get that cross compiled software onto your robot. But the, if you do it well and you automate it, it should be a much better developer experience. Um, so this kind of gives you an idea of this really bad uh, drawing I put together. It gives you an idea of that workflow, right? So you have your robot in simulations, my turtles, turtle bot in simulation. I write code. I go back and forth. I write my code. I get it doing what I want. Say I want it to, you know, do Roomba stuff and go run around the room and vacuum. So I get that all working. I write my test, my test pass. I'm like, cool, get commit, do my pull request. Pull request gets reviewed. Uh, okay, so now it's merging into master. Probably somewhere in your git commit hook or using some sort of cloud-based services. There are a few of them. I'm not going to pick favorites. You do your cross compilation infrastructure and basically then and only then you move it down to your robot and then you go give it a shot on the robot. That's usually the best way to approach this sort of problem. So let's change gears a little bit and talk about the, the secondary case, which is, hey, I have a piece of, or I have an ARM microcontroller in this cool piece of hardware that I built. And I really want to support ROS. I want to like enable the ROS development community. And, and you really should. Like we, building um, building ROS package, a well-supported ROS package for your component, whether it's like a motor driver or a sensor or whatever, will allow ROS developers to basically pull down that package, build it, and, and have it work fairly quickly with your device. Like you, if you're building hardware and you're at a hardware company and you, you seek that like really good developer experience of, hey, it just worked. I just grabbed a ROS package. I plugged it in and the thing worked instantly. Uh, this, is, this is the way the world's headed. Um, so, so let's talk about what I'm, you know, let's define what hardware is roughly. So hardware is something with a microprocessor, maybe has an RTOS running on it, but maybe doesn't have Linux running on it. The first case I'll show you is okay with Linux. The second case is really just for like an RTOS. Um, and the point I want to drive home with this is lots of people are doing this. A lot of big people are doing this. So there's UARM, there's Intel, there's SIC, there's Ouster, all the cool companies, you know, helping build vehicle autonomy. And going about building a, um, you know, a ROS package for your piece of hardware basically gives you this plug and play experience. Okay, so the first model, and this is sort of the old ROS model of how you interface hardware uh, with a ROS system. Um, it's a little bit tricky. So if you imagine, so here's your thing up here on the right. I don't know if you can see my mouse. Uh, there is this big square, and that's your piece of hardware. And it's got some sort of binary driver that, you know, you plug the thing in and it speaks to this driver, and that driver's got an API. So basically, all you have to do is you create a, a ROS node, which is inside a ROS package that speaks to that binary driver. And then you map, you know, if you think about it as a gateway thing, what you're doing is you're mapping your device's API into the sort of primitives that ROS provides. And you're also, um, if you can, using built-in ROS messages. We, we generally suggest that if you can get away with it, there's a lot of messages out there, use the ones that are predefined or a collection of the predefined ones instead of rolling your own. If you have to roll your own, it's cool. But we, you know, using things that people have already pioneered kind of gets us closer and closer to having standard APIs for different components. Um, but to, to make a long story short, you have a device, a camera or whatever um, that's outputting data. Uh, you can map that into a ROS topic and it just sort of moves that data through. Um, if you have a higher level API call, going back to my camera idea, like, um, you know, if you have to change the exposure, you can map that on into a, um, a ROS service and, you know, then there's just a service call and that allows it to be exposed to ROS and run in a ROS system very, very easily. Um, 
yeah, essentially, you know, and there's also action commands, which allow you to do um, more asynchronous calls that may be long term, which will allow you to build higher level behaviors if that's necessary for your components. Uh, and that's easier than you think. Okay, so the other case, the other way to do this, and it's something new that's come out fairly quickly, um, is micro ROS. And micro ROS essentially allows you to run a uh, ROS interface on a microcontroller uh, inside the RTOS. Um, and this is a sort of nascent new thing coming out in ROS, um, but it's sort of the new approach for embedded systems on ROS. So if you look at sort of the, the prior model, which is, um, you know, you had this sort of layer of indirection on your robot. Uh, micro ROS allows you to basically run, you know, direct ROS interfaces inside of your RTOS and interface them directly with the larger ROS system, talking over that native um, pub sub bus. And it just makes for a cleaner, uh, cleaner interface and easier user in experience. Um, but it's, it's fairly new. So as it stands right now, um, there's supports for lots of different RTOS systems. It can run on Nodex, it can run on Free RTOS, it can run on Zephyr, uh, and the Zephyr emulator basically works for off-device testing. Uh, you need to pick basically a ROS middleware implementation, which is, um, you know, look at the documentation for all of that. It's not that difficult. And it gets you to this really, really nice ROS2 plug-and-play interface fairly quickly. So I have a couple examples of different boards that are currently running this. Um, there's the Crazy Flight Drone, there's a new one for ESP32, there's a few other dev kits that you can take a look to see how this pattern is done. I've also got a link to the documentation right there. And, uh, well, does anyone have any questions? <laughs>